With the promise of summer, the Second World War entered a very positive phase for the Allies in 1944. After success in North Africa in the latter part of 1942, and the Allied invasion of Sicily and the landings at Salerno in 1943, followed by the Anzio landings in January 44, the German forces were definitely losing their Italian stronghold. The Russians were becoming more powerful in the east, pushing ever closer towards Germany since the surrender of Hitler's troops at Stalingrad early in 1943. Even in Southeast Asia, the Allied battle against the Japanese, part of Adolf Hitler's axes of evil, was gaining momentum daily. And of course, the daring Operation Overlord, which had culminated in the D-Day landings of June 6, 1944, along the coastline of Normandy, had been a triumph beyond even the wildest dreams of the Commander-in-Chief, General Dwight D. Eisenhower. Remarkably, Eisenhower had never actually seen active service, but he was nevertheless a superb administrator who was greatly admired by all the men he commanded, not least because of his pleasant and affable character. The respect and trust of the troops was actually of vital importance to Eisenhower because he knew that once Operation Overlord began, every soldier, sailor and airman, regardless of rank or experience, would be key if the battle for Normandy was to be won. The Allies could have taken a shorter route to France across the English Channel from Dover to Calais, but they deliberately chose a different route. In point of fact, this is precisely what Hitler and his generals were anticipating, and the Allies did all they could to convince the enemy that this was indeed the case. Secrecy was paramount, because the element of surprise was absolutely vital if Operation Overlord stood any chance of succeeding, and for every reconnaissance flight over Normandy, two were sent over the Pas de Calais. A concerted campaign, Operation Fortitude, was instigated to keep the Germans believing that the invasion would target Calais, and events soon proved that it had served its purpose. Adolf Hitler was fully aware that an attack on the Western Front through France was imminent, but early in 1944, the Soviet Red Army in southern Russia was giving him a great deal more cause for concern. The Nazis attempted to stem the Russian tide by building large fortifications, but Hitler's fears of being forced into a retreat by the Allies on all fronts were being proved well-founded. Also, the Americans were now dominant in the Pacific against the ever-tenacious Japanese. Because of the sheer size of the US Navy, the Japanese were finding it difficult to secure the islands that they'd previously seized. However, for the Americans, containment was the watchword during these crucial months of 1944, because until Europe was liberated, they would have to fight on without any Allied reinforcements, while the European theatre of war became the primary focus as Operation Overlord progressed. On D-Day, five landing beaches had been selected between Cherbourg and Caen, with American troops taking the two most westerly of the beaches, codenamed Utah and Omaha, while the British and the Canadians targeted the eastern beaches of Gold, Juno and Sword. The plans were thorough, and due to the fact that a full moon was imperative for light and tidal patterns, the date was set for the 5th of June 1944, but when the weather turned unseasonably stormy, Eisenhower had a big decision to make. The only options were to either postpone until the 6th of June, when the weather would be a little better, 
or wait for two weeks for the next full moon. A wait of a fortnight presented huge logistical problems if the invasion plans were to be kept secret. How could the thousands of men aboard their ships and ready to fight be safely disembarked and, more importantly, where? Consequently, despite the risks posed by the weather, June the 6th was selected and just after midnight, the ships embarked silently out onto the stormy sea. The landings at Utah and Omaha differed greatly. At Utah Beach, an early air assault bombardment, backed by shell fire from battleships, cruisers and destroyers, helped to clear the landing area. The terrible weather also played its part, surprisingly helping the Allies, as many of the German e-boats, scheduled to be patrolling the Cherbourg coastline, turned back to port. The storms also caused one of the US divisions to land at least a mile off course, which, luckily for them, was a stretch of beach that was virtually unguarded, and they quickly secured the area, almost unopposed. At Omaha, the American troops also encountered problems with navigation due to the weather, but their off-target landings were nowhere near as fortuitous. By contrast, they came face to face with the highly experienced German 352nd Infantry Division on exercise in the area, and American casualties were devastating. The German vantage point high on the cliffs meant many US troops were killed as they waded through the water before even managing to reach the beach. But eventually, despite these losses, Omaha was secured. The British and Canadians also faced different challenges as they landed. At Gold and Juno Beach, there was heavy resistance it took great strength and bravery for them to be secured. Sword Beach wasn't as well defended, but the concentrated landing area and high tide gave the invading allies huge problems. But eventually, just as at Omaha, the Germans were overcome. Building on the success of the landings, highly skilled engineers had constructed temporary floating harbours, codenamed Mulberries, which were towed across the channel piece by piece and put in place, ready to receive supplies, vehicles and reinforcements to continue the fight for France. In the weeks following D-Day, the Allied invasion force steadily made progress, liberating the people of France literally, village by village. The excitement was rising, and after so many years of Nazi oppression, the Allies received the warmest of welcomes from those they set free. Back in Great Britain, News of the triumphant landing certainly boosted morale. But for Adolf Hitler, as the realization dawned that the battle for Normandy was being lost, it was time to retaliate. Hitler had always promised the German people that he had a secret weapon. And with news of the events in France traveling fast, he needed to boost morale and reaffirm the Nazi position of strength. The weapon in question was the V1 bomb, taking its name from a German word meaning weapon of vengeance, and it most certainly was. The effectiveness of these bombs came from the fact that they were unpiloted, basically an early cruise missile that could be launched from mainland Europe across the channel to target Britain. After being launched, the precise autopilot technology would accurately track the target area where it was due to detonate, and the damage the bombs could do was horrific. Powered by a combination of petrol and compressed air, the V-1 could travel at great speed. It 
made a very loud buzzing sound from the jet engine that pulsated 50 times a second. And this buzz gave the V1s many nicknames, including the Buzz Bomb and the Doodlebug, after a loud Australian insect. The sound was terrifying enough, but when it went silent, it was really dangerous, with there being about 15 seconds before the huge explosion. However, for Hitler and the German developers of the V1, there was one major disadvantage. There was no way they could be sure whether the bombs had reached their targets or not. As London was targeted relentlessly, there was a wall of silence, as none of the devastating hits or the casualty figures were reported by the press. And great care was taken to ensure that news of the V1 success didn't reach Germany. What's more, the indomitable spirit of the British, typified by the people of London, had been a major problem for Hitler throughout the conflict, most notably during the Blitz. And once again, the great British public stood firm in their resolve to see Hitler defeated. Extra barrage balloons were deployed, and planes like the Spitfire were used to attack the V1s in the air, and almost 2,500 of them were shot down. It was quickly evident that Hitler's secret weapon was not going to win Germany the war also proved extremely counterproductive as the Allies became more determined than ever to do all in their power to see the Nazi reign of terror brought to a swift end. For the British soldiers fighting in France, fear for their loved ones back home made them push all the harder to break out from the beaches. And having had all the advantage of surprising the Germans, it was now imperative that they consolidated their position. Ironically, Hitler's generals still believed that the main attack would still come via Calais, with the Normandy invasion being a decoy. But the Germans soon realised they had a fight for survival on their hands. General Bernard Montgomery, who'd been instrumental earlier on in the war, leading British troops to victory in the Second Battle of El Alamein before taking a significant role in the fight for Europe, certainly found heavy Nazi opposition at the eastern end of the D-Day landing beaches. His troops suffered many losses, and Montgomery was forced to retreat in order to rethink his tactics. Boosting the German resistance in this area was crucial, because if Kahn fell to the Allies, it would leave the road to Paris wide open. However, the occupying army were far from strong, despite increased numbers, and it appeared that they were operating without coordinated artillery support, suggesting a breakdown in communication, which was enough to allow the Allies to continue their advance. Due to the fact that over a million Allied troops had landed in Normandy by mid-July, Montgomery could keep the Germans busy fighting in the northeast of France, which gave the Americans the opportunity to advance further south, and when Kahn was eventually liberated on the 19th of July, the Allies were in a very strong position indeed. With a strategic pincer movement, the Allies steadily surrounded the Germans, and the Nazis could do very little to hold on to their occupied French territory. And as more Allied troops were brought in, the Germans quickly became outnumbered, and retreat was the only viable option open to Hitler and his generals. And to make matters worse for Hitler, the situation on the Eastern Front was getting tougher by the day for the Germans, as Operation Bagration gathered momentum. Bagration was the code name for the Belo-Russian strategic offensive operation, which aimed to clear all German forces from Belarus in northern Russia to Poland, which had started 
on the 22nd of June and continued through until the 19th of August. There were four armies in place to take on this task, which consisted of the 1st Baltic Front and the 1st, 2nd and 3rd Belorussian Front. This mission, which was later described as the most calamitous defeat of all the German armed forces in World War II, resulted in the complete destruction of the three major components of the German army group in occupation, namely the 4th Army, the 3rd Panzer Army and the 9th Army. The speed the operation advanced at was remarkable. And by the 7th of July, the Red Army had marched into Lithuania in southern Russia and had managed to secure it by the 13th. By the end of Operation Bagration, the German losses were so great that even forced conscription couldn't begin to replace the men that had been killed. The Axis lost about 20 divisions in all, and 50,000 Germans were captured and taken prisoner from the city of Minsk was the last big German base on Soviet soil, liberated on the 3rd of July. When the Red Army saw the devastation of the villages, where vast numbers of the population had either been killed or deported under the brutal control of the Nazis, they marched the German captives through the centre of Moscow before thundering into Poland. The statistics from Bagration are staggering. Overall, German casualties, including those killed, injured or captured, have been estimated at 670,000, with more than 59,000 vehicles destroyed. The Soviets, nonetheless, paid a very high price, with as many as 60,000 men killed. But the Russians were by this time unstoppable as the Red Army thundered into Poland. However, with the Polish Home Army already fighting the Germans in the Warsaw Uprising, they waited rather than storm into the nation's capital. When Germany had advanced into Poland, triggering the start of the war back in September 1939, the Nazis had been secure in the knowledge that the Russians would not attack them because of the non-aggression pact Hitler had made with Joseph Stalin. In return, Hitler had agreed that the Russians would split Poland with Germany, so consequently the Polish nationals were keen to take charge of their own affairs. The Warsaw Uprising began on the 1st of August 1944, just days before the advancing Red Army were due to arrive, with the Poles eager to triumph over their German oppressors. Sadly, they simply didn't have the strength and the Germans fought hard to maintain their position. When the Soviets arrived, they did not, as expected, join the battle lines against the Germans and literally came to a standstill within a matter of miles of the city. The uprising continued for 63 days and the sudden halt of the Red Army is a controversial issue that historians are still disputing to this day. It's been suggested that the Soviet advance from Russia had left the Red Army exhausted and lacking the power to take on the Germans, while others argue that this was not the case at all. Stalin may have had called a halt so that the Polish home front would be defeated, as they would undoubtedly be opposed to the Soviet regime after the war. The Soviets claimed that it was lack of fuel after Operation Bagration that left them stopping short of Warsaw, but it's unlikely anyone will ever know for sure. As September drew to a close, so did the uprising, and on October the 2nd, the Poles surrendered to the Germans, having lost 18,000 soldiers, 
while between 120,000 and 200,000 Polish civilians had died, most of them murdered by the German troops. After they surrendered, the Nazis burned the ancient city to the ground, leaving nothing but ruins for the Russians to take control of when they finally reached Warsaw. With the mighty Russian allies advancing from the east, and American, British and Canadian troops gaining momentum in Western Europe, the German generals knew that they were in a very dangerous position. Hitler's behaviour was ever more irrational, and it's even been suggested that he was suffering from the onset of Parkinson's disease. The Allies were slowly but surely winning the war. But it wasn't only his enemies that Hitler had to fear, because on the 20th of July 1944, an assassination attempt came from within the ranks of his army, and what's more, it very nearly succeeded. For some time, Hitler had made few public appearances, and he was actually attending a meeting at his Wolf's Lair headquarters in East Prussia, discussing the deterioration of the military situation on the Russian front, when a bomb exploded, killing four officers and severely wounding many others. Hitler survived, sustaining only minor injuries. But it wasn't the work of one disaffected German. There were many more involved, although the main driving force was Colonel Klaus von Stauffenberg, one of Hitler's most trusted men, who had close access to the Führer. It's interesting to note that there was actually a German resistance movement dating back to Hitler's rise to power. And it's worth just looking a little more closely at von Stauffenberg's background to discover how this extraordinary event came about in the aftermath of D-Day. Von Stauffenberg came from a high-ranking Roman Catholic family, his father being a significant figure in the German court, while his mother was a countess. He was the eldest of three brothers and started out studying literature, but eventually turned to the military for a career. Before the outbreak of the Second World War, von Stauffenberg was commissioned as a lieutenant and studied weapons and transportation, but was part of the German First Light Division that stormed into Poland in 1939. Von Stauffenberg was a supporter of Hitler at this point, and considered joining the Nazi party, especially as the Führer had signed a pact with the Catholic Church. However, like so many of Hitler's treaties, it wasn't long before there were serious infringements and the Catholic Church began to condemn the Nazi ideology. The suppression of religion began to escalate within the Nazi regime, but it was the people of the Jewish faith who quickly became Hitler's targets. It was the Nazis' barbaric treatment of the Jews that first caused von Stauffenberg to question his loyalty to Hitler, especially after an event that took place between the 9th and 10th of November 1938. Known in history as Kristallnacht, which literally translates as Crystal Night, this attack on the Jews was a warning to the world of what was to come. By the morning of November the 10th, the Nazis had murdered 91 Jews, deported some 30,000 of them to concentration camps and destroyed over 2,000 synagogues. Anti-Semitism was now an inherent part of Nazi ideology, fueled by Hitler's fanatical hatred of the Jews, who he blamed for Germany's economic decline since losing the First World War. Von Stauffenberg knew this was wrong, and when the violence extended further to include anyone involved with the Bolshevik movement, the alarm bells were already ringing. Hitler actually gave written orders that anyone displaying any active representation of Bolshevik ideology was to be killed immediately, and many right-minded Germans, including von Stauffenberg, appealed against this. As the war progressed, von Stauffenberg's opinion of Nazi conduct and policies deteriorated, 
and he became convinced that Hitler was corrupting the German Empire by taking innocent lives. By 1942, von Stauffenberg knew in his heart that Hitler and his Nazi henchmen had to be stopped. In 1943, shortly after being promoted to Lieutenant Colonel of the 10th Panzer Division, von Stauffenberg's vehicle was bombed by the British during the Tunisia campaign in North Africa. He was fortunate to survive and was hospitalised for three months before being sent home to recover further. Von Stauffenberg's injuries were severe. He'd lost his left eye, right hand and most of the fingers on the other hand, but he was determined to continue as a soldier. However, it was during his rehabilitation that Henning von Treskow, a serving officer but a conspirator in the German resistance, approached him. Aware of von Stauffenberg's organisational skills and dislike of the Nazi movement, von Treskow offered him a job as a staff officer at the headquarters of the German Home Army in Berlin to assist when necessary in the fight to remove Hitler from power. Fully aware that his injuries meant he would never be able to assassinate Hitler without help, von Stauffenberg agreed to take the position. Von Treskow was convinced that only the death of Adolf Hitler would stop Nazi tyranny, and as the Allies played their part, advancing towards Germany, the resistance prepared to do their duty. The assassination must be attempted at all costs. What matters now is no longer the practical purpose of the coup, but to prove to the world and for the records of history that the men of the resistance movement dared to take the decisive step. When von Stauffenberg joined the movement, various plans were in place to kill Hitler and his highest ranking officials. Somehow, something always seemed to go wrong. Eventually, von Stauffenberg realised that despite his injuries, he was able to get close to Hitler without arousing suspicion, so he put himself forward to carry out the assassination. By this time, the D-Day landings had been a great success for the Allies. The support for von Treskow and the German resistance had increased as plans were put in place to rid the world of Hitler and the Nazis for good. On July the 11th, 1944, von Stauffenberg attended a conference at the Burghof, Hitler's country retreat in the Bavarian Alps near Berchtesgaden, carrying a bomb in a briefcase. A colleague waited nervously in the getaway car for von Stauffenberg to complete the assassination of Hitler, along with Heinrich Himmler and Hermann Göring. But yet again, it was not to be. When von Stauffenberg arrived, he realised that Himmler and Göring were not present, and after a telephone call to his co-conspirators, the decision was made to abort the mission von Stauffenberg returned to Berlin to try again another day. The conspirators wasted no time in rescheduling. By the 15th of July, von Stauffenberg was ready with his bomb once again at Hitler's headquarters in East Prussia. Fortune yet again failed to smile on von Stauffenberg as Himmler was absent from the meeting and another assassination attempt was aborted. Getting all three men together in one place at the same time was proving very tricky indeed, and the Nazis were certainly becoming very suspicious. Arrests were being made, and the conspirators selected the 20th of July, knowing that speed was vital, and this would very possibly be their last window of opportunity. On the morning of the 20th, von Stauffenberg travelled from Berlin to Hitler's Wolf's Lair headquarters in East Prussia, armed with two bombs in a briefcase, where he entered the meeting room as planned before the Führer's arrival. 
Excusing himself to change his shirt, he found a small room in which to activate the pencil detonators using small pliers. Having no right hand and only three fingers on his left, this fiddly job was far from easy. And by the time a guard knocked at the door to hurry him back into the meeting, he had only managed to activate one of the bombs. There was nothing for it. Von Stauffenberg could only hope that this one bomb would do the trick. At just after half past twelve, Von Stauffenberg placed the briefcase under the table in front of him. And as soon as he was able, with Hitler in position, he left the room using the excuse of an urgent phone call and waited for the explosion. But a latecomer to the meeting took the seat von Stauffenberg had just vacated and casually kicked the briefcase a vital few inches forward out of the way. When the bomb exploded at 12.42pm, the unfortunate latecomer and three others were killed, but Hitler once again escaped death one of the least hurt in the blast because of the protection the large solid oak conference table had provided. Von Stauffenberg, who was observing the explosion, was certain that no one could have survived the enormous blast and headed back to Berlin, convinced that Hitler was dead. Elated, von Stauffenberg met with his fellow conspirators, ready to take over power in Germany. However, at seven o'clock that evening, joy turned to despair as Hitler made a radio broadcast stating, a very small clique of ambitious, unscrupulous, and at the same time criminally stupid officers made a plot to remove me. The German news agency added, the German people must consider the failure of the attempt on Hitler's life as a sign that Hitler will complete his tasks under the protection of a divine power. The very small clique that Hitler spoke of was actually a lot bigger than he could have imagined. When he sent the orders for von Stauffenberg to be shot immediately, the officer charged with the task was himself a fellow conspirator and the orders were not undertaken or passed on. But capture was inevitable, and before the day was over, von Stauffenberg and three of his fellow conspirators were found. At 1am on the 21st of July 1944, lit by the headlights of a truck, 36-year-old von Stauffenberg uttered his last words, which translated were, Long live our holy Germany, before being shot. Von Stauffenberg's brother, Berthold, along with over 200 other conspirators, were tried before a judge and sentenced to execution. Eight of these sentences, including Berthold's, were death by strangulation using piano wire hanging from meat hooks. These horrific killings were filmed and shown to senior members of the German armed forces to discourage any further assassination attempts, as Hitler became more paranoid and dangerous as the prospect of Germany losing the war became a question of when rather than if. While the battle for Normandy had raged on through June and the Russians pushed ever closer to Germany, out in the Pacific the Americans had been busy making waves. The target was the island of the Marianas and the first of these was Saipan. Japanese planes were shot down in their hundreds and US submarines caused a significant amount of damage as they torpedoed Japanese carriers. The Allies were victorious 
when Saipan fell on the 9th of July 1944, followed by the resignation of the Japanese Prime Minister Tojo just nine days later. He had attempted to conceal the events at Saipan, trying to convince his people that the Japanese had been victorious. But when the news leaked out, Tojo had lost all credibility. The Americans were relentless following their victory at Saipan, with a campaign to take the islands of Tinian and Guam, which they achieved in August 1944. After the humiliation suffered at the hands of the Japanese at Pearl Harbor back in 1941, the Americans were now poised to take the war to the Japanese mainland. And as the summer of 1944 continued, back on the European front, the Americans were also being kept extremely busy as the breakout from the Beachy Head gathered pace after the liberation of Kong. It was time for the Allies to work closely together now, and Montgomery had expected Eisenhower to appoint him commander of the Grand Forces in Europe. But with the American generals Omar Bradley and George S. Patton being key to the liberation of France as well as Montgomery, this was probably going to be unworkable. There'd been antagonism between the American generals and Montgomery since the Allied advance into Sicily, and Eisenhower knew only too well that his countrymen would never accept Monty in command of them. Also, there were now a proportionally high number of US troops fighting in Normandy, so logically an American with overall leadership responsibilities would make the most sense. The obvious solution was for Eisenhower to take on the role himself, and to appease Montgomery, Prime Minister Winston Churchill promoted him to the rank of Field Marshal. For Montgomery, the next task was codenamed Operation Goodwood, launched on the 18th of July, and its aim was to minimize German resistance to Operation Cobra which would see the bulk of the American forces break out from the beachhead and encircle the Germans, creating the Falaise Pocket. Cobra should actually have begun on the 18th of July as well, but bad weather, something of a characteristic of the summer of 44, meant that it was postponed until the 25th of July. A further operation, codenamed Atlantic, was given the go-ahead to secure the Verriers Ridge, which was a significant sector of high ground to the south of Caen. Taking this high ground would not only give a great defensive position, but would also open up the path to the town of Falaise, which was proving very difficult to get to with the heavy German occupation of this strategic ridge. Operation Atlantic failed to achieve its aims, Operation Spring was launched with the Canadian general Guy Simmons, given the job by Montgomery to devise a battle plan to take the ridge and Phase 1 began on the 24th of July. The North Nova Scotia Highlanders made the initial attack on the town of Tilly la Champagne in the early hours of the morning. Simmons had devised a way of bouncing light off the clouds to improve visibility so the Allies could see the enemy positions. Unfortunately, this also meant that the ridge's German defenders could see the Canadians too, and this resulted in a hard and bitter fight. In Phase 2, the Calgary Highlanders targeted towns and a further ridge, and although they also faced tough German resistance, the area was eventually secured. The German counter-attacks for both Phase 1 and 2 were swift, with panzer tanks advancing against the North Nova Scotia and the Calgary Highlanders, forcing the Allies to retreat from their newly secured areas. The Black Watch then embarked on the third phase, targeting the town of St. Martin, before moving on to take the Verriers Ridge. 
During D-Day and the weeks after, the bad weather had worked in the Allies' favour, convincing Hitler's generals that the invasion would not be until conditions improved. But this was not the case when it came to Operation Spring. The Germans moved their 9th SS Panzer Division into the area as soon as news of Operation Spring reached them. The postponement due to bad weather gave the German army time to reinforce the ridge with another four battalions of men. The Canadians suffered terrible losses. In this phase, few soldiers survived to tell the tale, proving that despite the success of D-Day, the battle for France was still far from being a foregone conclusion. It would take until early August for this area around Caen to eventually be secured. Nevertheless, although the breakout was happening slowly, the Allies were making progress and on the 15th of August, Operation Dragoon was set in motion as the Allies prepared to make an amphibious landing between the southern French towns of Toulon and Cannes. Dragoon had first been planned as Anvil alongside Operation Overlord, with troops attacking from the south at the same time as the Normandy landings. Cooperation between the Americans and the British had been crucial, but not always harmonious throughout 1944, and Anvil had caused something of a rift. Winston Churchill was convinced that the war in Italy needed to be concluded at speed, with pressure maintained until the capture of Rome. But the decision to start invasion plans for France was taken, and Operation Overlord selected. But while the beaches of Normandy were targeted, the Americans were also due to land in southern France, putting Operation Anvil into action. Both missions required landing ship tanks, LSTs, but Churchill asked President Roosevelt to transfer these crucial vehicles from Operation Anvil to Operation Overlord, but the Americans were not keen to do so. This row continued for some time, until a rehearsal for loading men and machinery onto British beaches, similar to the five chosen for the Normandy landings, proved disastrous. Americans training for Utah Beach at Slapton Sands in Devon were attacked by German e-boats from Cherbourg scoring direct hits on five landing ship tanks and killing more than 700 men. The landing ship tanks were impossible to replace so close to D-Day and Operation Anvil was postponed. Ironically, even after the success of D-Day, Churchill was still opposed to Anvil, arguing that resources would be put to better use in Eastern European countries, where he felt it was dangerous for their Russian allies and Joseph Stalin to gain too much power. This is where it's suggested the name change for the operation came from, with Churchill dragooned into accepting it by the Americans. After all, Rome had fallen to the Allies in early June, so Churchill no longer had that argument. And after the success of Operation Cobra, which was due in no small part to American strength, the British Prime Minister had no choice but to agree, and Dragoon was set to commence on the 15th of August. Calling on as many as 200,000 American, Canadian, Free French and British troops the landings took place in seven different areas along the beachhead and were a great success. By the second day, over 94,000 troops had come ashore and as so many German troops had been sent to fight in northern France, Operation Dragoon met little opposition. 
invasion was carried out with speed and efficiency, and in just 24 hours, advances were made 20 miles in For the French resistance, this was exceptionally good news, and for those fighting on the streets of the nation's capital, hopes for a speedy liberation of Paris gained momentum. The French resistance had been born when the Vichy regime had been put in place when Hitler stormed into France in 1940, and it steadily grew and became more organised as the German occupation progressed. Governing France during the occupation, between 1940 and 44, and presided over by Marshal Philippe Pétain, the Vichy regime was put in place by Hitler and controlled by his Nazi henchmen. For the French, this just added insult to injury, and a resistance movement quickly grew. Even so, it was extremely difficult for the resistance to mobilise, as there were strict curfews in place with censorship and propaganda also used by the Vichy government to keep control of the enraged French citizens. Also, anyone even suspected of being a part of the resistance was treated with vicious brutality. In 1943, the milice was set up, which was the Vichy government's equivalent of the Nazi Gestapo. The milice were responsible for killing thousands of their fellow Frenchmen during Hitler's reign of terror. There were collective punishments and bloody massacres, and even as late as June 1944, with liberation in sight, the killings continued. At one village, where the presence of the resistance was suspected, a German SS division murdered all 642 inhabitants, from babies to those in their 90s. The men were rounded up and mowed down with machine guns, while the women and children were burnt to death in the village church. But by the time June the 6th dawned, the French resistance could boast an army of about 100,000, and they were ready willing and more than able to prepare the way and assist the Allies in Operation Overlord. The military intelligence they could provide was invaluable, and when it came to performing acts of sabotage on German power, transport and communications links, they were extremely efficient. Not surprisingly, the resistance wanted Paris liberated as soon as possible, and an uprising began on the 19th of August. Despite the fact that Eisenhower, as the Allied commander, thought it too early to move into the city, he was given an ultimatum that forced him to change his tactics. Charles de Gaulle, who, leading the Free French with the 2nd Armoured Division, threatened to send his army in, single-handed if need be, to assist the uprising. In order to avoid what had happened when the Russians failed to intervene in the Warsaw Uprising, Eisenhower agreed that the Allies would support him. The Free French fought fiercely in their battle for Paris, and by the 16th of August, the police, the workers on the Paris Metro and the Postal Service had all gone on strike. By the 20th of August, the uprising was in full swing, with barricades and trenches appearing everywhere. Men, women and children were helping to carry materials on wooden carts for the resistance, and the spirit of patriotism was growing. After a short ceasefire, both sides attempted to evaluate the situation. The Germans lacked any depth in numbers, while the resistance lacked the weapons of war, which the Nazis still had an abundance of. By the 22nd of August, the battle for Paris was back in full swing. The resistance managed to force many of the German army of occupation into retreat.
Enraged by this, Hitler demanded that maximum damage was done to the city, and Dietrich von Scholtitz, the man commanding the German army in Paris, gave the order for the bombing of the Grand Palais. Two days later, the Free French 2nd Armoured Division moved into the centre of Paris, forging ever onward, and General Pierre Billot, commander of the 1st French Armoured Brigade, appealed to von Scholtitz's sense of decency with a simply worded observation. I estimate that, from a strictly military point of view, the resistance of German troops in charge of defending Paris cannot be efficient anymore. In order to prevent any useless bloodshed, it belongs to you to put an end to all resistance immediately. Hitler gave repeated orders not to surrender under any circumstances and is quoted as saying that the French capital must not fall into the enemy's hands except lying in complete debris. Von Scholtitz made the hugely difficult and brave decision to disobey these threatening orders and allowed Paris to be taken back by the Free French intact. Triumphantly, Charles de Gaulle made a moving and extremely patriotic speech to the newly liberated people of France, letting the whole world know that we, who have lived the greatest hours of our history, have nothing else to wish than to show ourselves up to the end worthy of France. Long live France. De Gaulle was appointed president of the provisional government of the French Republic, which immediately came to power. The liberation of Paris was a key event in the Allies' journey to victory in the Second World War, and as the road to Germany lay before them, the race for Berlin was now on. The months of July, August and September 1944 were crucial for the Allies. After the build-up to D-Day and the daring and courageous attacks on the German strongholds along the Normandy coastline, the true enormity of the task that had been undertaken was fully evident. After the relief of the events of the 6th of June, the Allies now had to face a long, hard push through France to reach Germany. For Adolf Hitler, despite events suggesting that he would never be able to win the war, the determination to fight on was as strong as ever. But the Führer's capacity to make rational decisions was deteriorating, and his own high-ranking officials, including Hermann Göring, Heinrich Himmler, and Joseph Goebbels were having serious doubts about Hitler's ability to lead them for much longer. To consolidate their position in France, the Allies would face many dangers yet. As the Russians pushed for Berlin from the east, the Western Allies would have political issues to sort out with their Soviet counterparts, as they too had Berlin firmly in their sights. With the end of the war coming into view, the challenges for the free world were as great as they'd been back in 1939. But at last it seemed that the hopes and dreams of a new age, free from the tyranny of Adolf Hitler, were about to be realised. <laughs>